Good morning, church. Uh, good morning, Dorothy. You're the first person I usually say good morning to, so I'll say good morning to you first. And uh, I miss you guys. I, uh, I will be glad whenever we can worship together again as a group. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to do what we need to do to get our praise on. So, Oh, and Scott, uh, we're not doing give us clean hands this week, so maybe next week. Stand. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Sing, we stand. We stand and lift. joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and we worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. And everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Oh, the earth is filled with His glory. It's rising up. And it's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown. It's rising Everyone sing, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the earth is filled with His glory, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the earth is filled with His glory, sing holy, holy, oh, oh. There's not going to be a meet and greet time, obviously, unless you want to just say hi to your neighbor who you're watching this with. But uh, we're going to sing Bless the Lord 10,000 Reasons next. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. His holy name seem like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. You're rich in love. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It 
it's time to sing a song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes bless the lord oh my soul His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul Worship your holy name You're rich in love You're rich in love To aim heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his whole Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failed, the end draws near and my time has come. Still yet my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship your whole like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name I will worship your holy name I will worship your holy name
out your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing Great are you, Lord? One more time. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will say, Great are you, Lord? It's your breath in our lungs, so we How great is our God? The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, yet all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps. Darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. Our God, and age to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. And God.
I hope you all enjoyed worship as much as I did. Let's pray. Father God, you are truly a great God, and we know that you're totally in control of every situation. God, um, we just pray that you would help us to draw closer to you during this situation, and uh, God, just help us to find out what you're trying to teach us through, through all of this, and God, I just pray that you would just help us to get back uh, to worship together as soon as possible and um, help those who are sick right now and those who are in financial crisis. And God, uh, just help us to be a light to, to each other and uh, in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you here again to another one of our services online. As you can see, our sanctuary is empty. We're still under, not quarantine, but social distancing. Some people have said that the, the governor has stated that um, churches could start meeting possibly, and I just want you to know that we're not. Um, we still think that this is a dangerous thing, and for a while longer, we're going to continue to do services this way. Um, I've noticed on Facebook, uh, it's kind of comical because I can tell that you're lonely and um, bored out of your minds. Everybody's putting games on there saying, somebody please play with me. Or they're putting questions on there about tell something about yourself on a list of questions. Some of the things I've noticed that are online are, are questions that are more philosophical or theological in nature. Somebody has asked the question, um, uh, online, um, do we, is this the end times or, or uh, are we in a time of prophecy being fulfilled, that sort of thing? That's a good question and maybe in a few weeks I may try to answer that one. Another question, one I'm going to deal, I want to deal with today is the question that people ask in times like this and that is, is God punishing us? To go through something like this and with all the people dying, is God punishing or judging us either as an individual or as a nation? Now, I get that question from people from time to time. They'll come into the office and they'll be going through some struggles in life. And uh, they'll ask me, so pastor, is, do you think God's judging me or is God punishing me? And I'm going to give you the same answer that I give to them. And that is, I don't know. Now, I know that may not help you with your question, but just bear with me because I think what we talk about today will be of some benefit to you. But I don't know. Who does? Who can tell whether God's doing that uh, or not? I know the Bible teaches us that God chastens His children from time to time, and that's certainly true. That's biblical. We find in the Bible, Bible examples of where God um, punishes nations for being wicked. Uh, that's certainly true. But what I think is this, I think that if God punishes somebody, they should know it. And if God punishes or chastens or disciplines somebody and they have no idea that that's what's happening, then it's wasted. Um, I can remember as a child, my mother or dad would punish me, they'd spank me, or as I got older, they'd restrict me from doing certain things. But they always told me why. They always told me the reason why I was being disciplined, and sometimes it was my smart mouth. Sometimes it was just disobeying what they had told me. But there was never any confusion about it because they realized that if you don't know what you did wrong and don't know why I'm doing this to you, then it's of no benefit. And that's true. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that if God is going to discipline you as an individual or even as a nation, I believe that, well, let's back up. Let's say for us as individuals here in this church, uh, believers, I, I really believe that the Spirit of God that lives inside of you is going to convict you and convince you and bring that to mind. I often ask people when they ask me that question, I'll say, well, is there something in your life that you keep thinking about, you feel guilty about, something that God seems to be bringing to the forefront of your thinking? And sometimes they'll say, yeah, um, there is, and they'll tell me what it is. And I'll say, well, then you need to deal with that. You need to confess it. You need to deal with that before God and go on. But then there are those that say, well, you know, I've tried. I've thought about it. And there's just nothing that I can think of that maybe God would be trying to straighten out in my life. So then the question arises, then why am I going through this? Why is this happening to me? 
And see, that's really the question we all ask at times like this. Why are we being subjected to this isolation? Why are people getting sick and dying? Why is our, uh, you know, the stock market dropping and financially we're hurting and people losing jobs? Why is all of this happening? And again, I have to say, I don't know. I can't give you a direct answer, but here's what I do know. I do know that when you look into the scripture, there are a number of reasons why people suffer. There are a number, number of reasons given why people go through hard times like this. Now, I'm not gonna give you an exhaustive list. I'm only gonna talk about one, but let me give you a few examples before I get to that one, if you would. There was uh, an incident in the life of Christ when he and his disciples are uh, walking through a town and they notice a blind man. The text tells us that the man had been blind from birth. 38 years he had been blind. And the disciples naturally asked the question that everybody assumed, especially during that time, because that's what they had always been taught. And here's the question. It's in John chapter 9, verse 2. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. You see, they had been taught that. The Pharisees had taught them that if you sin, God's going to get you. God's going to zap you. And if there's something going on in your life, if you're not wealthy, healthy, and wise, and happy, much like what we hear on the TV today, then God must be punishing you because you wouldn't go through hard times like that if he wasn't. Now, what's interesting is how Jesus answered. Watch the answer in verse 3. Neither, he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Why did God allow this man to be born blind and stay blind for 38 years? For that very moment. In other words, it happened according to what Jesus said, for this moment that I would come and I would heal him. And he would be an object lesson of grace. He'd be an object lesson of mercy. And many people would come to faith because they've seen what I can do. And they would put their faith in me and be saved. And that was the reason that man in that situation suffered as he did. Now, there are other examples. You know, we take Paul, for example. Paul was turning the world upside down with the gospel of Christ. And people were being saved left and right. Churches were being established. And what happens to him? He gets put in prison of all things. We find out in the New, in the New Testament that Paul spent a couple of stints in, in the slammer. Um, and you wonder why. Why would God do that to the man that is just doing his will and turning the world upside down for Jesus Christ? Well, what we realize is that it was in prison that Paul, Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit some of the greatest books of the New Testament. You know, Paul wrote Ephesians in prison and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. All of those were written while he was in prison. We look at that and we think, well, that was a terrible thing to do. God says, no, this is my will. This is what I choose. And I have a reason for doing it. Just like with the blind man. It's, there's another example of Paul and his thorn in the flesh told to us in Corinthians. We don't know what it is. We think that it was probably his eyesight was, was bad, but we don't know for sure. But God said, no, Paul, I'm not going to heal you. Paul prayed three times to be healed and God said, no, because my power is shown or displayed through your weakness. So it's my will that you maintain or, or keep this thorn in the flesh, this illness. And Paul said, that's fine with me. And I'll go on. There are many other examples in the Bible. Now, before I get to the one I want to talk about, let me ask you a question. Here's the question. Can God affect people's lives in different ways at the same time through the same events or circumstances? In other words, let's take the situation we're in. We're going through this period of isolation and downtime where we're struggling with this. And the question is this. Can God be working in, in the lives of individuals in different ways to accomplish different things in the same event, the same circumstance? Well, yeah, the answer is obvious that he can. This is the reason why you can't answer the question, is God punishing us? Because who knows? We don't know why. But each individual is going to come through this and they're going to be stronger, hopefully. They're going to be closer to the Lord, hopefully. And things are going to be done. 
Think about the guy that uh, is perhaps living a life that's sinful. And he comes through this and God's got his attention. And he makes some changes during that time. He makes changes concerning his life and what he's doing and he, and he decides to stop. Well, for him, this was a time of chastening. Somebody else may be listening and, and observing and watching and hearing sermons on TV or, or the internet and they're seeking because they're confused and afraid and they come to Christ by faith and they're saved. So for them, the reason was quite different. The same spirit took it and applied it and used it in the lives of people to accomplish something different. Maybe somebody learns to pray that has never prayed before and that's something they'll carry with them. Maybe another dad or mom has changed their entire priorities because of what they're going through here. A workaholic all of a sudden being cooped up with their children at home realizes, I need to spend more time with them. And so as a consequence of what we're going through, that person changes their ways and spends more time at home. Another person may realize, and they've never realized this before, that God loves them. But through this, somehow God has convinced them that He loves them. Someone else has learned how to minister or to serve. They've never done that. But coming out on the other side of this, that may change the way they live life. That's a good thing. The question is this. What is God teaching you? What is He teaching you? Because what He's teaching you might be different than what He is trying to teach somebody else. The reason He takes this and uses it in your life will come, will be a different reason perhaps with a different outcome than someone else's life. So today, here's what I want to do. In the time we have remaining, I want to, to share with you a valuable lesson that I believe that each one of us as believers in Christ has to learn at some point in our lives. Now, for some of us, you may be learning it for the first time as we go through this particular ordeal we're going through. But if not this time, there will be another in which you're going to have to learn this because every one of us have to come to grips with this question and this issue. This is, the, this is one of the most important issues that as believers we will ever have to come to grips with. And it is something that we all have to learn. Unfortunately, this is one of those lessons that can only be learned under pressure. It can only be learned in a time like this. You're not going to learn this in the good times when, when the blessings are coming and things are working out. That's not when this is a lesson that you're going to be aware of. But only in times like this, when you're suffering or struggling in some way, are you going to come to grips with what this is teaching and what I'm talking about today. It applies to each and every one of us and nobody is exempt. And I want to show that to you today. But before I get to the passage, I want to share with you some background on the story that we're going to be looking at. Here's the background. Some of you are very familiar with this. We're going to go all the way back into the Old Testament to a time in the nation, when the life of the nation of Israel, when they were just coming out of Egypt. You know the story, Moses, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, they're out of Egypt. And they're wandering in the wilderness as God's leading them to a place, Mount Sinai, where He's going to teach them His law. Now they've been out of Egypt now for about two months and they've run out of food. The food is com completely gone. Everything they brought with them out of Egypt, they took when they left, they've consumed it. And now they're complaining. And they're going to Moses and they're saying, it would have been better off for us if we would have stayed in Egypt. At least there we had meat to eat. We had onions and garlics and spices, all the spices of Egypt. And now we're hungry. And we would rather go back in bondage so that we can have our stomachs filled than to continue on this journey with you and with God. So Moses said, fine. And God led him to do this. He tells the people to go out in the morning and on the ground they would find food. And the food appeared with the dew, the Bible tells us, and they go out the next morning and there's manna. The manna, the word literally means, what is it? And they walked out and they saw that and they thought, what is this? It was a wafer of some kind, sort of a wafery bread type substance. The Bible tells us it tasted like coriander seeds and honey. I don't have a clue. But they ate it. 
And for the next 40 years, they ate it. They had manna loaf, manna sandwiches, manna stew. I mean, they're just, <laughs> there's only so many things you can do with this stuff. You talk about boring? Yeah, it was boring. But it sustained them. It nourished them and it kept them alive. God leads them and eventually they come up to the southern border of Israel. They're ready to go in and God says, go in and take the land. And they said, uh-uh, we're scared. We're not going to do it. There's a whole story with that. But in part of God's judgment against them, he said, then here's what I'm going to do. Those of you that are above the age of 20 will die in the wilderness. Those that are 20 and below will go into the land. Not now but 40 years. And those children that are born during this time will go into the land. So they wandered. 40 years of wandering in the desert. All because they wouldn't trust the Lord to go in. I had a professor one time. He said, think about this. Probably a million and a half to three million Jews came out of Egypt. And those that died in the wilderness, you can figure that on average they would be doing about 200 funerals a day. That was a terrible event, terrible time. There was nothing but misery. There was nothing but death, separation, life without a purpose. They had nowhere to go. They weren't doing anything. They had no meaning to life. They just moved. Every time the cloud moved, they would move. And wandering aimlessly through the desert until finally those that had rebelled against God, died. And they come to the end of that 40 years, and Moses now addresses the people. And he's telling them that Joshua's going to take them into the land, and when they get into the land, they're to obey God. And then he says this, and this is what I want you to see. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. Now watch. Moses said to them, Remember, how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you, and I get this because this is the reason this is the purpose. This is the lesson. To teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now think about this. Look at this text. He says, I want you to remember this when you go into the promised land, the land of blessing. I want you to remember how God has led you in the desert these 40 years. How He has fed you with manna, even though you didn't like it, it kept you alive. You wandered in this desert. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell. He's provided everything you need. And it was a miserable time, but you got through it. And I want you to understand and remember that He was humbling you. And He was bringing you to a point where you would decide to follow Him. Because up to that point, you hadn't. He humbled you and He brought you to that point, causing you to hunger he says, in order to humble you before Him because He wanted to teach you this lesson that man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, we look at that and sometimes we think, well, it's just another verse saying you ought to study the Bible. But that's not what it's saying. The bread in this passage represents everything that man thinks he needs to be happy. They wanted food, they wanted shelter, they wanted all the things that we want. And they were basically saying to God, we would rather have it our way than to do it your way. And God said, you're going to walk in the desert here until you learn this lesson. And here's the lesson. That it's better that you obey my will, what I decree for you, than to be chasing after the things that you think are going to make you happy. Now, I've boiled it down into a statement that you can write down. Here's the statement, the lesson the, out of this passage that I want you to get. And this is what you can apply to your, to your life in this situation that we're in here today. The most important thing in life is not that you are satisfied, 
but that you are content in the will of God. Whatever God decrees for me, whatever God's will is for me, that I find contentment there in obeying Him rather than chasing after what I think I need or even what I want. See, this is why this is so important. Because you and I will continually rebel against how God leads us. The things that God takes us through, the things that God demands of us, we by nature will rebel. We always do. And you and I have got to come to the point in life where we submit. We simply submit and say, Lord, your will be done. I trust you and I'll obey you. Now, there are examples in Scripture where people did this. I want to share with you a couple. The Apostle Paul was one that had to learn this. He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, here's what he says. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. In other words, whatever God has decreed for me, whatever His will is for me, I have learned to accept it and to trust Him and to be content. Now that's saying a lot. Paul was beaten. He was left for dead. And some theologians believe that he did die and came back to life. Shipwrecked and left in the sea. Rejected by everybody that was in his life that cared about him and imprisoned numerous times. How could he be content? But he says, I've learned that. I've learned to be content because I've learned to accept the decrees of God in my life, His will for me. And I've obeyed and I've followed Him and I've walked with Him. And that's life. It's not the things that I may have wanted or may have thought that I needed. But I've discovered that life is pursuing God and walking with Him. Now this one's going to surprise you. But do you know that even Jesus had to learn that? Listen. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8, it says this, Son, though He was... He learned obedience from what He suffered. Now think about what it's saying. Even though He was the Son of God, He learned obedience by going through the things and suffering through things that the Father brought into His life. Humanly speaking, as Jesus was human and deity, He would have not wanted to suffer some of the things that He did. But yet the Father said, this is what I want for you. And he, by going through it, had to learn what it meant to obey, what it meant to submit. This is why he kept saying, I came to do my Father's will, not mine. I'm here as a submissive servant. One of those situations is we see in, in the situation where um, he's tempted by the devil. Now, the Bible tells us that he is baptized by John the Baptist. That was the beginning of his ministry. And the Bible tells us that immediately upon coming up out of the water, that he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. So he goes out into the wilderness. The Bible says that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He ate nothing. He is weakened. Then as, when the devil comes to him and Satan comes to him, and there's, here's, here's what he says. He says, why in the world are you going hungry? Now, I'm ad-libbing here, okay? But why are you going hungry? He said, you're the son of God. He said, why don't you command those stones to be turned to bread and eat and be satisfied and be happy? Why are you putting yourself through this? Here's the response that Jesus gave to him. Now listen. It says that Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's quoting Moses. The same thing that applied to Moses and the children of Israel, he's saying applies to me too. I could turn those stones into bread easily. That's not the point. The point is that my father said to me, go into the wilderness and fast. And that's what I'm doing. I don't particularly like it. I'm hungry. But I will not disobey. I've learned to be content with what God the Father has decreed for me. 
there's another incident in the incident in the life of Christ. This is a, an important one. Listen very carefully. This one's in the Garden of Gethsemane. We know from the text, as you probably are familiar with already, that Jesus was in the garden praying. That night he would be taken. The next day he would be crucified after being beaten to death, almost. Um, he's in the garden and he's praying. The Bible says that he's praying, Oh God, take this cup from me. Take this from me. I don't want to go through it. The Bible says that he was sweating drops like he, as if he was bleeding. Some theologians ask, was he really bleeding through his sweat? We don't know. But he was agonizing. He was scared. What was he scared of? He wasn't scared of dying. He had just raised numerous people from the dead. He's the, he, he controls life and death. What was he afraid of? Why was he agonizing? He was afraid of sin. In a few short hours, he would take the entire sin of the world upon himself. Something God had never done. Perfect, righteous being would now become sin. And I think that horrified him. Anyway, he is agonizing over it. He goes and he prays. Then he comes back and gets his disciples up and he talks to them and then he goes back. And here's what I want you to see. Matthew chapter 26, verse 42. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Wow. <laughs> Lord, I want to escape this. I don't like it. But Lord, if this is what you have decreed for me, and it can't be done any other way, if this is your will for me, then your will be done. I'll submit and I'll, I'll die. Aren't you thankful that he did? And really that's what the, 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 the New Testament is emphasizing, that he did this for you. It was a tremendous sacrifice on his part. All of these examples and everything that I was sharing with you are simply to get you to understand that the lesson we have to learn is that instead of fighting God, try to get our way like we always do. The biggest part of Christian maturity is you coming to grips with the fact that God is God and He can do what He wants. And we've got to be content with that. I can't tell you why things happen in your life. I can't tell you why we're going through this situation. But I can tell you this, that God wants every one of us to learn that He's God, He's in control. And right now it's His will that we do this. And we have to submit. That's a lesson that you'll take with you for the rest of your lives and it will change your life. It literally will. I want to close by sharing or leaving you with three Things that I want you to remember. I will just call them things that I want you to remember in way of application. Sort of looking at the sermon and sort of summarizing it and coming out with three bullet points, okay? Here's the first thing that I want you to remember, and that is this. That sometimes God has to humble us before He can bless us. It seems like in every time in Scripture where God humbled somebody, whether it was Moses, the children of Israel, Paul, or Jesus, there came after that a time of blessing. And when we submit and learn our lessons, then God blesses. And I truly believe that when we are finished and we've gone through this and it's behind us that we will look at this and we will praise God for what we've learned and how He's brought us through it. So there's a time of blessing coming. We just have to be faithful until then. Here's the second thing that I want to leave you with, and that is even if we don't understand we can be assured that God still loves us. Even if we don't understand, we can be assured that God still loves us. I've talked to so many people that are going through situations in life. And as they begin to question this and the reason why, one of the things that always comes to the surface is the feeling that I'm going through this because God's turned His back on me and He doesn't love me. That's not true. God is totally committed to you and me. He will never, ever forsake you. He will never leave you. 
and his love for you is not diminished one bit. God is working, doing his will according to the way he wants. We submit. And sometimes we won't see the effect or the, the blessing of that until later. But never, ever question his love for you. Here's the third thing that I want to leave you with, and that is we must learn to be content with God's will, even if we don't like it. Even if we don't like it. You and I are called upon to be content. Paul said, I had to learn it. Jesus had to learn it. And you and I have to learn it. I've got to be content with your will, even though I don't like it. And some of the things we're having to face here in this country, people becoming deathly ill and dying and all of the things I've talked about, we don't like it. But you know what? I really believe this is going to be a time of growth. It's going to be a time of growth for all of us. For God's people especially, for the churches, I think we're going to grow. And we're going to learn to appreciate. And we're going to learn what it means to walk by faith. I want to leave you, in, I, I, let me say this. I noticed as we looked at the uh, YouTube uh, video last week that we made, we noticed that there are more people viewing this than attend the church here. And that's a good thing. I want to encourage you and invite you to do that. So with that in mind, I have to believe that some of you don't know the Lord. Um, I have to believe that maybe somebody is tuning in, searching for something that you desperately need, but you don't know quite what it is. I want to share with you a verse, and uh, then I'm going to close, okay? But here's the verse. It's the 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now look at the verse. God the Father made him, Jesus Christ, who had no sin to be sin for us. See, that goes back to what we were talking about a moment ago. That he became sin for you. So that in Him, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are in Him, the Bible says. In Him, you might become the righteousness of God. Whenever you and I come to Christ and we acknowledge that He died for us and He paid for our sins and the Spirit of God it fills our hearts and our, our, our bodies, um, the Bible says that God imputes to us or credits to our account His righteousness. That doesn't mean that I'm that righteous in practice. I still struggle just like everybody else. But it means that God sees me that way. Jesus died for me. He took my sin and He credited to me His righteousness. Now listen, you are maybe one of these people that thinks that somehow you can work your way and be good enough to get into heaven. And you've rejected religion because you think all you've got to do is be good. Let me tell you, you can be perfect and you'll still die and go to hell without Christ. That's why He died on the cross. He took your place. He paid for your sins. He's your substitute. And you need to believe that. You need to trust Him. And when you do, God makes you righteous enough to get into heaven. He declares you so in His sight. That's the gospel. That's the message of salvation. That's grace. And I want to invite you that if you don't understand that, you have questions about it, please feel free to call here at the church. Uh, it's on the website. The phone number's there on the website. Just call us and I'll be more than happy to talk with you more about that. I want to thank you for being here. I want to close in prayer and uh, just appreciate you watching this video. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your tremendous gift of salvation. And we thank you that our Lord Jesus did submit to you, that he did your will, that he went to the cross for us. And Father, someday we will all share the blessing together in heaven. Lord, right now we're struggling and uh, a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of things going around in our minds. Lord, I pray for peace for each one of us. But Lord, more than anything, I pray that each one of us would learn the lesson that we don't live 
by the things that we want. That's not what life is all about. The most important thing in life is that we come to understand your will and accept it, that we live in that, even if it hurts. Father, it's better for us to be there than anywhere. We thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you in the, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. And I appreciate you joining us today. God bless.